Well, I think we can start. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here to, uh, today. My name is Hugo Avila. I am professor at the Metropolitan Autonomous University in Mexico City, and I will chair this webinar. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Yan Xie. Dr. Xie received his PhD in chemistry from Miami U University and a BS in chemical engineering with emphasis on electrochemical engineering from Tianjin University in China. He is currently a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Energy Engineering at Purdue School of Engineering and Technology, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. He has published more than 70 papers and two book chapters, has 17 patent applications. He has been a reviewer for major journals, including Nature and Science. He is also a panelist reviewer for the US National Science Foundation, the Advanced Research Project Agency Energy Fuel Cell Technology Office, the US Department of Energy Office of Technology Transfer and the Canadian National Science Foundation. Before joining the academia, he conducted research in the areas of fuel cell research and development, lithium ion batteries and artificial lungs at Battelle Memorial Institute. He also worked at Cabot Corporation, Los Alamos National Laboratory. He developed electric propulsion systems for, for electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles at General Motors Advanced Technology Vehicle Center. Today, Professor Xie will give us the presentation Striking the Core of PM Fuel Cell Performance, Engineering the Ionomer Catalyst Interface. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. So please let me do let me know if you now you cannot hear me well. Okay. Um, so my topic is about the uh, anomer and the cast interface. Okay. Um, so this is my you know presentation uh, presentations are, are online. So I'm going to talk about the brief background. The challenges for uh, you know polymer electrolyte uh, membrane fuel cells and approaches we're taking. Uh, so uh, engineers on them and the CATS interface. Uh, so if I still have time, I may touch a little bit about the uh, graphene supported polymer CATS and some conclusions. Okay. Um, so uh, as the you know uh, host is already introduced, so I'm not going. To talk about too much about the uh, achievement. Uh, so, but I do like to acknowledge for uh, fuel cell technology office, um, you know, Department of Energy, which is support our fuel cell research and also vehicle technology in you know, office to support our battery research as well. Uh, in addition, so US Navy uh, support us for this mine battery safety. Uh, the National Science Foundation, General Motors, Liberal, it also provides the industry grants for us to do some um, uh, hydrogen storage and uh, uh, battery separators work. Okay, particularly would like to thank for the Department of Energy Office of Science, uh, Office of Basic Energy Science, because we're using the advanced photon source uh, in Argonne Natural Lab. So um, those are people in my group, uh, you know, uh, student, former student, and a postdoc, collaborators, uh, you know, a lot of people from uh, natural labs, Argonne, uh, you know, from uh, um, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, uh, different natural labs in the from industry as well. Okay. Um, so uh, this is our research lab for fuel cells. As you can see, um, Uh, I have a uh, 
So this is a, uh, can, uh, can anyone see my cursor or? <laughs> Sorry guys. Okay. Um, Ready, we are seeing your presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to find where is the pointer. Uh, 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 to the left, at the bottom, maybe you can find there are some options. No, uh, uh, yes, at your left, at the bottom, normally there you have three options there and uh, from Zoom, and you can choose the pointer. Uh, I didn't see no, any. No. Okay. Well, I need to see those. Huh. Okay, anyway, so uh, forget about that. So, um, sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so this is our research lab, and you can see I have five fuel cell test station, which you can test the membrane electron assembly MEA. Uh, and also I have a, uh, um, this is a, a BET. We also have TGA in our lab. Uh, so then uh, we have a bunch of battery cyclers and all stuff. Okay. Uh, this is uh, um, my research portfolio. Since I uh, first time to meet you guys, um, our research directions typically is energy and environment because I used to teach you thermodynamics and so any uh, spontaneous process, if in practical you know, environment to proceed is always irreversible. So therefore there are always left impact on surrounding. So our goal is you know, improve energy conversion efficiency and reduce the impact to the environment. So we have typically have fuel cell research uh, focused on high performance uh, catalyst and also uh, focus on study the membrane electrical assembly and also durability as well. And also we have the battery research, uh, rechargeable lithium metal, uh, metal oxide, uh, and also we have um, uh, lithium ion battery safeties and polymer electrolyte separators and additive. And then we have some uh, nanomaterials research to focus on carbon black and nanographite. Uh, then we do some graphene. So now we expand our nano research to utilize graphene for battery research, for fuel cell research. Uh, in addition to those, we also do some clinical technology. Basically, we reverse the fuel cell working principles to reduce the CO2 to chemicals like a formaldehyde or methanols. And so then we also do some water treatment, uh, trying to uh, you know, uh, treat the, uh, remove the heavy metal ions or some organic you know, um, compound from water and using the functionalized the carbon black. Finally, we have direction for hydrogen storage. Uh, basically, we're trying to enhance the physical, um, the physical uh, absorption, you know, hydrogen absorption, our graphene or other solvent materials. Um, so this is a schematic showing the most important components for, uh, you know, polymer electron membrane, which is called membrane electro assembly, MEA. So the MEA is two sides of cast layer sandwich the electrolyte membrane in the center. The cast layers have a carbon spheres with nano atom particles, typically uh, around uh, um, uh, two to three nanometers. And uh, so this is a, a typical structure though. Uh, be because I'm working on fuel cells for more than 25 years, I cannot tell you everything. So I'll just give you some uh, briefly 
something to let you feel or flavors about our research on you know fuel cells. Okay, this is a piece of uh, we take a piece of the uh, small piece of the castle layer, and we like to study you know the structure of the castle layer. Okay, so then uh, what we did is uh, this is a uh, we went to uh, our natural lab uh, for the synchrotron facility. We did a nano CT. Okay, basically, we like to understand, you know, what the structure look like inside the cast layer though. So you can see that there's so many pores and also the, uh, you know, interconnected pore and there are so many, you know, different uh, uh, phase uh, in the uh, cast layers. And this is a, you know, ways resolution about uh, uh, 60 nanometers resolution. And so then with knowing the detailed, you know, three dimensional structure, so we can design the cast layer and with the best performance, okay? So because the resolution is only like a 60 to 80 nanometers, so we like to you know, know more in details. And this is a, a TEM, and so you can see this is, you know, carbon you know, particles, and those are dots is, you know, black dots is a cast nanoparticles. And here you can see the pores here and here, and those very light portion is called anomer as a bender. So what we're trying to do here is we did a three dimensional and uh, TEM to try to understand the structure and uh, with a much higher resolution. And this is about like a, a nano one nanometer, so point one nanometer resolution. So we can study details about those uh, pore structures interface and different components and distribution, okay. Now, um, there's another things we did, a very interesting, um, you know, uh, study though. And this is a graphing sheet, okay. So we uh, basically synthesize kind of nanoparticles over the graphing sheet. Under normal condition, and this is a very stable, but graphing is stable, kind of stable. And uh, however, once we heat it up the whole, you know, components to 1000 degrees C, and once we start to introduce hydrogen and those carbon indirect, you know, carbon atoms in direct contact with kind of nanoparticles will catalyze and carbon will react with hydrogen and for mason, okay. This is a really simple, you know, chemical reaction, organic chemistry, and so then, you know, sim simple missing formation reaction. The whole purpose we're trying to make a more defect. So then we can be, we'll be able to using defect, you know, graphene to observe hydrogen molecules over this. So this is easy to see, right? So then uh, this is a kind of like a three dimension, I'm sorry, this is a kind of an in situ TF. This is a kind of nanoparticles about the seven nanometer lens, okay? So my good friend, Eric Stetch, uh, who now is in the uh, you know, University of Pennsylvania. So he helped me get the um, in situ TM. So we heat it up to uh, 1000 degrees C and you know, in the TM chamber, introduce hydrogen. Once we start hydrogen in, and so then the kind of particles start to tumble. The reason is because all the you know carbon direct contact with you know platinum nanoparticles will be catalyzed with react with hydrogen form mason. So then will be escaped. Okay, so then the carbon be each out in the front, and so leave, leave all those the um, trenches for uh, defects for the graphene. Yeah. So this is a kind of giving you a little bit of flavor of what we did for some nano, you know, nano uh, research for that. Uh, this is another one because I don't have time for the battery research to uh, present to you. And this is a one of the work we did, the very interesting work. So basically this work is trying to solving for lithium dendrite formation, okay? In normal case, if you have a lithium metal right, as the anode, and a castle separator, right? Once you start charging, and so then 
we're going to start forming the lithium metal dendrite, our lithium surface. And where is the cycle going on? Uh, the dendrite started growing and growing. And so then eventually penetrated through the separator and finally touch with the castle and cause the battery shorting, uh, fire, smoking, and all safety problems. This, this has been long-standing challenge for lithium metal used as rechargeable battery air node. So what we propose is this. So we know the dendrite is always going to grow, right? So instead, you know, try to stop growing, we're trying to control the growth direction. So what we do here is basically we're coating the separator on the side towards to the lithium metal with the uh, you know functionalized non-carbon black okay particles. So then, and also this uh, you know layer carbon layers electrically connected with the lithium metal, and so therefore that have equal same potential, okay, same potential as lithium metal surface. So once you start to charge it, and the dendrite start from a grow from bottom and also from a top. So the, the grow, once we are charging towards each other, and eventually we're going to touch with each other. So the driving force for the, you know, this dendrite grow is a potential difference from the base and to the peak, you know, the peak, okay? So once they touch with each other and it's going to short, right? So then, you know, potential become the same. So then they're going to start, you know, grow horizontally. And eventually they will form a dense pack with your metal layer, okay? Um, you probably ask me, this is easy to see, right? How do you know this is as, you know, you design? So what we did, one thing is we did the in situ TM. Basically, we coat uh, lithium metals on both copper and gold electrode, okay? So then we take this one to shortly, briefly expose to the air. So they're gonna form a lithium oxide. So lithium oxide will be served as a solid electrolyte. So then we coat the, you know, the, um, the carbon layers over here. Then basically from this direction to see if the lithium dendrite grow from this side and from a carbon coating layer as well, okay? And here is the results. You can see the lithium dendrite grows from bottom and also lithium dendrite grows from top down, okay? And you can see here, right? So this is exactly from top, bottom up and top down. So this is really showing you the, the dendrite grows, it is controlled is redesigned. Okay, uh, this work was a publication on Nature Energy. So it was 2017. Yes, 2017. Yeah. All right. So now, um, so maybe I'm not sure how many how many of you guys know about a fuel cells, and uh, I like to share. This is a, a animation show you how the fuel cell works, and so generally speaking, so hydrogen from a storage tank, the air from a compressor all sent to fuel cell stack. So in the fuel cell stacks, we have many single cells. And each single cell consists of a, a flow field on both sides, which distributes the hydrogen and air on the other side. So in the centers, so we call the membrane electrical assembly. Hydrogen will be outsized on cathode la anode layers and become proton and release two electrons and electrons go through external circuit driving the load. The proton will transfer through the membrane to the cathode side meet with oxygen and form the water. So as long as you continue provide hydrogen and air, the fuel cell stack will continue to generate electricity. Okay. And this is really um, the structure I was just briefly mentioned about it. Both side and on the castle is a porous catalyst layer. Okay. The primary nanoparticle is serving as a catalyst set on the carbon sphere. And the red stress represents the honor bender, which bend all those particles forming a porous layer. Okay. 
And so the membranes basically call fluoridated um, sulfur acid, polymer electrolyte. It's basically have from backbone with cytogen SO3 functional groups. And so then this is a form of a uh, reverse missile structures and SO3 groups on, on the surface and the, you know, hydrophobic backbone, from backbones inside though, okay. All right, so this is, a, a, you know, we see the structure of the anomer, uh, I mean, the anomers, uh, you know, in the, using the uh, DM. And so this is a, typically like this. Okay, like this. Okay. Now, uh, for the fuel cells, and um, uh, typically we're talking about, you know, uh, which one uh, is the uh, uh, slowest one, right? So this is kind of like, a, you know, contribution of a polarization, okay? Which means how much you lost, right? How much you lost. So generally speaking, for hydrogen, the simple reaction like hydrogen, and they're gonna form, a, you know, protons and release electrons. This is our station reactions, you know, very very fast. Typically, even we go as like a, you know, two amps per square centimeters, and it's only about like a forty millivolts loss. Okay. However, for the oxygen reduction, oxygen reduction. Even with very small current, you know, roughly one milliamps per square centimeter, you already see about 400 millivolts to water the lock. Okay. So this suggests the oxygen reduction is much slower, much, much slower than the, you know, oxygen reduction. Okay. So therefore, the fuel cell research is really not focused on, you know, hydrogen side. It's really focused on the oxygen side. So um, there's a, very often I've been asking, you know, why uh, you guys need to using uh, platinum as a cast, right, cast. And this is a kind of, you know, a, um, uh, So this is a typically what we're using for is uh, um, so this is what typically using is uh, the um, you know exchange current density I zero, which is kind of like a reaction constant to measure a, how a reaction uh, inherently how fast reaction can go. Okay, so if you look at this right for uh, different cats we're using platinum, palladium, ricinium, iridium, and gold for oxygen reduction reactions. And the, you know, the first one is, so for uh, oxygen reduction is platinum, okay? 10 minus 10. However, you look for hydrogen ox, you know, oxidation reactions. And uh, so relatively speaking, it's much faster, 10 minus three. Okay, there's about like a seven order of magnitude difference between anode and the cast. Okay, anode cast. So we have no choice in how to you know use the you know platinum as a cast. As cast. So the approach for the cast, you know, and for now is either you can increase platinum utilization, right? Or you have the platinum alloy, or last one is you have the uh, non platinum cast. Okay. So, um, you now the challenge for, you know, this, right, is how do we increase the cast, you know, utilization, right, cast utilization. And so here's a, you know, challenge we have. Typically, uh, we develop, right, we develop in a lot of catalysts. And uh, typically, we're using called the rotating disk electrode to characterize the catalyst in performance. Right, so typically we call inherent catalyst performance. You can see this, right? So we uh, develop the catalyst, you know, in some new catalyst, like you have a nine times higher mass activity compared to the normal platinum over carbon, you know, x two. Okay, so do the platinum nickel and uh, you know alloy catalyst. 
Now, the problem is um, when it goes past into the memory electron assembly, and we didn't see that improvement. So we didn't see nine times improvement. So the problem is we only see less than 50% we can realize in the MEA. Okay. So this is a problem you know, for long, you know, standing challenge for fuel cell research and development. How do we transfer the significant, you know, breakthrough and catalyst development and into the MEA performance, okay, the MEA performance, okay. So uh, the, the challenge for us is because we think, okay, so in the RD, you know, your typical skeletal and in that catalyst layer, so each catalyst, you know, individual catalyst particle is a fully exposed to the liquid electrolyte. Okay. So therefore, all the catalyst particles will be utilized, participate in the oxygen reduction reaction. However, in the you know a catalyst layer in the MEA, and because we are using the armament benders, you know, some of those be covered, the some of those not. So if the cat is not covered by armor, and so therefore there's no electrolyte. And so therefore those cats particles will not be participate in the oxygen reduction reaction. So we think this is a you know interface uh, interface between the the parent cat nanoparticle and the armor and the interface is the critical role for determining the MEA performance. As you can see on the back side, that of the plant particle, that portion of plant nanoparticles is covered by the armor. So the proton can transfer through armor to this site, and electron can go from a carbon to plant nanoparticles to reach by this side and also oxygen can flowing down and so then those proton electron and same times you know reach the same sites and simultaneously and produce the water okay um so this is therefore the interface and in really determine how the performance of the MEA you can imagine that so this portion of the cat surface will not be utilized because there is no anomer cover on here. So imagine that if this particle fully covered by the anomer and this half of the cat surface will be utilized. So then the performance will be double, okay? On the other hand, we also like to have the anomer as soon as possible. As you can see, anomer is diffusion barriers for oxidative diffusion through the membrane to the anomer here, right? So the thinner and the less diffusion barriers and a better diffusion for oxygen, you know, oxygen to here, okay? Now, so the, the problem is we all understand this, right? So how do we solve this, right? How do we solve this, okay? So uh, for now, for the traditional, conventional MEA, you know, uh, making process, typically, they have no control for this, right? Basically, they're mixing the, you know, cast and waste anomer. And so then uh, they're going to be heating up. So you evaporate all the, you know, solvents and eventually left the porous structure. Because there's no control, so then the anomer will be participated, you know, precipitate out from the solvents, right, from solvents. So the distribution of anomer is pretty set. And word ununiform, okay, non uniform. And uh, so then you can see quite a lot areas of the primal particles cannot be utilized. Okay. And what we propose is this, right? So basically, we're saying, okay, why don't we just uh, put a positive charge on the carbon surface, right? So then, because the animal, you have a negative charge. So therefore, they will be forming, you know, like a um, spontaneous forming, you know, attract each other, right? Kind of like a self, you know, self assembly, right? self assembly, and forming the anomer uniformly, you know, power 
the cast you know surface and very thin layers and so then so this should be you know uh, really, you know uh, um, achieve the much better performance in you know in terms of uh, uh, mass activity electrochemical acid surface area and the kinetic uh, and the power performance as well as well so the idea is, you know, you get a uniform, you know, nice uniform and um, and the maximum coverage for this. And how do we do this, right? How do we do this? So what we propose is using what called um, sodium, um, um, uh, the uh, um, what we call the functionalization, and using um, the uh, diosium reaction. Okay, diosium reaction. So basically, you can use the diamond salts, and why is the functional groups you like to put it on, right? So then, through the bio, you know, diosium reactions, you basically, you know, implement or cover and bond the Y groups to carbon surface, to carbon surface. So what we can do, so for this kind of reaction route, we can basically put the uh, negative charge SO3 groups and carbon acid groups, and also we can put tetramine groups uh, pass with each other on the surface. We can also put the, uh, you know, polymer groups, okay, like, uh, uh, you know. No, it opens. So we can also put the polymer groups like, uh, uh, you know, poly, uh, poly uh, tetramine or uh, polybenzene, metazole, PBI, or those. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a kind of a showing you after functionalization, how that will affect the surface of the And this is a carbon black and uh, it's a control it's a baseline. So it's a pretty hydrophobic. Once you keep the water. And this one is the SO3 function line. And so this is a very, very hydrophobic. You can see it's a stop to experience so well in the water. And this one is highly hydrophobic. This is down the top of the Yeah, so then he's going to speak all the interesting about it. And some of those will be the first. But, you know, I'll spend like a 10 minutes and just set it up on the bottom of the screen. And this one, and it doesn't matter how you stick it. Um, so this is really uh, what we did, right? So then we basically uh, did a you know systematic study. Right? So we put a positive charge on the carbon surface. We also put a negative charge on the carbon surface. We like to prove you know how uh, the interaction between isomers and the carbon surface, and for both you know can form a nice on the interface cast interface or not. So we're assuming that your child is not going to form a nice interface though. Okay. And first one we did was using uh, solid you know state IMR to see if we're going to form a covenant bonded you know groups, right? And this will tell us exactly we basically founding the covenant bond, you know, the you know, the functional groups, not you know chemical observed. You know, bond, you know, groups. Okay. Um, second one is we're going to using XPS, and so to characterize the SO3 groups over the surface. And also, we're using a titration to determine in two groups, and basically it's about four micromoles per square centimeters, which is basically almost 100% the coverage. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of like a TEM showing you. You know, we have all three different carbons, okay? And this is a baseline, and this is a negative charged carbon carbon black. This is a positive charged carbon black. And we're trying to control all the cast nanoparticle size as close as possible. So we can, we want to exclude the particle size effect on the performance of the NDA, okay? So we're talking about so much Forming the anomer catalyst in the face, right? So I have to prove to you guys, right? 
So this is the first things we do is uh, we're using um, called the Atlas one, the X-ray scattering, combined with Corel TF. Okay. So basically, we're trying to see, okay, you know, the U sets can measure the particle size change. So after the, you know, the 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 uh, catalyst missing with anomer, compare with this is the catalyst and uh, uh, you know with without the anomer, right? So we want to see how the size changes. If the size become larger, and that means and there is interaction between the anomer and the catalyst particles. And it does show us, right? It does show us there is a, you know, increase the particle size, increase particle size. And this is a summary. We did all the, you know, um, we did all the USAX combined with Cryo TM. And USAX was done in other natural lab and Cryo TM was done in UC Davis, okay? So this is a summary of results. You can see that. So the baseline slightly increase and the possible charge, the carbon, and ways and anomers and increase eighty seven percent. Okay, negative charge and uh, ways anomers actually the size of shrink. Okay, size shrink. And this is also zeta potential. Okay, zeta potential measurement. So you can see that and negative charge and the nephion anomers negative charge. Those two pretty close with negative value. The possible charge about seventy four. Okay, seventy four electron volts. And so this is really exactly match, you know, what it's supposed to be, okay? So those are for um, uh, size change, okay? Uh, in addition to that, and we do the band energy on the mer in a carbon particle, right, carbon particle. And this is very interesting. This was done in uh, Berkeley National Lab at UC, Ber uh, I mean, uh, UC Berkeley though. And so basically, the, you know, just measure the um, bonding energy and between anomer and a carbon. Uh, you can see X72 is very little. And uh, so the negative charge, there's no bonding energy at all between anomer and a carbon particle. And for possible charge, there's strong you know, interaction, strong interaction. And this is really showing there is strong interaction, okay, strong interaction. Now, finally, so we're using crowd TM. And we directly see, you know, observe is any uh, anomers and gonna interact uh, with the uh, carbons. And so you can see that. I mean, this is a, a pristine or baseline x tree. This is a, you know, uh, anomer uh, particles, and this is a carbon. You can see the state, you know, it's not forming nice, you know, interface. Though. And for this one, the carbons and negative charge, the anomer even stay away from the carbon pond. However, if you look at the positive charge, right? So anomer spread outward, okay? The change of the anomer sheet from a sphere, you know, to uh, the sheet, those, you know, spread all over around surrounding the carbon, you know, test particle, test particle. Okay. So this is really showing you under passive charge and the anomer in a cast interface, it it does a form, you know, in the liquid, you know, liquid form, the liquid phase. So uh, so far to here, and uh, we just uh, you know uh, I just demonstrate you. So we did see the anomer interface form the liquid phase, right? So remember though, when we form the cast layers, we need to heat up and remove the solid to form a porous cast layers, solid layers, right? So now we look into the cast layers, solid layers, right? If the anomer in a cast interface is preserved from liquid phase into solid phase, right? And so this is a down the TEM and the, this is a cross section of the cast layer, okay? So we make cast layer and solid. And so cut your metro tones cut in the surface, cross sections. And so then we can see that, right? So then you can see this is a, um, the, uh, this is a that we chart and can see the chunk of the anomers and, uh, you know, 
on the surface of the cloud. In quite a few regions, right? There's no anomaly at all, okay? And so then you can see there's a nice uniform small spread over and the anomers and the over the cancer surface, the other cancer surface, okay? So this is really from, uh, you know, solid layers. You know, when you see the anomer interface with the per, you know, is preserved, is preserved. And uh, in addition to that, and the test layer, and the morphology change a lot. The morphology change a lot. And this is a baseline is about 4.4 .4 micron uh, in terms of sec, but total cast layer is thickness, right? And for the SO3, and so you can see pretty dense, pretty dense pack layer. And for the, you know, possible chart, and it got a pretty porous and, uh, you know, large, uh, you know, thickness. Okay, seven micros. So this is from other side to prove the existence of anomer in a cast interface. Okay. Um, this is a really uh, uh, three dimensional and uh, uh, TEM. So uh, uh, this is a top view, and basically we're trying to see. On the both negative positive charge and negative charge, you know how the pore, you know, pore structure changes for different uh, charge. Okay, and uh, this is three dimensional. You can see that, and three dimensional. This is a positive charge, and the white represents the pore structure. Okay, and this is a, a negative charge. And this is analysis for mercury perimeters. And so you can see that uh, for the, you know, blank SO3, negative charge, positive charge, and the blank, you know, the, the positive charge have a highest core volume, okay? And uh, for the uh, metal pores and for the cast layers made of that. Uh, another thing is so we compare, and this is how the electrochemical active surface area, which is major of how much, you know, the anomer cover on the cancer surface. You know, obviously SO3, this is a non-uniform or less covered, the only 21. And the, you know, the positive charge is about a 70. About 70. So this is really show, you know, for using charge attractions, you can build the uh, you know anomer catalyst interface. Okay. Finally, and this is a catalyst uh, MEA performance, and you can see that. And this is a blue line is SO3, and so you have torus performance, and the red line is possible charge. Okay. So in terms of mass activity and uh, current density. Uh, and the power density and all the positive charge, all the perform, you know, the negative charge as well as the control is baseline. Um, finally, so there's another thing that's very important, right? Since we're talking about the anomer and the, the anomer, the thin film anomers is serving as the proton conductor, but also serve as oxygen diffusion barrier. So therefore, the thinner will be better for the performance. So this is what we did. So we're basically using linear current density, you know, technique to study, you know, how sick the anomer will be. So this is a, you know, measure on the different RNH for linear current density. And so then, uh, so then based on that, and we did a bunch of calculations uh, using the, you know, uh, different uh, uh, definitions and uh, eventually what we get a result is, so the, the effect of, you know, the, uh, you know, anomer sickness, right? For the, uh, uh, the uh, positive charge is about a 2.66 uh, nanometers 
sick. And so then the positive charge ion of film and to the uh, negative charge of ion of film the ratio is about you know almost 13, 13, okay? which means the negative charge, you know, the onomer, uh, the sickness is about 13 times thicker than the positive charge, you know, onomer. Okay. This is a well explained why the performance, fuel cell performance is so bad and uh, for the um, for the negative charge, okay, negative charge the cast. Okay. Um, so this is about the onomers. Um, uh, so this is another, um, you know, uh, new uh, research we're doing now is basically we're trying to using the functionalized, you know, carbon blocks and uh, put those positive charge, try to guide the position of the platinum nanoparticles. So make them more uniform, okay, make them uniform. And this is a platinum uh, cobalt. And so, um, you can see that. And so this is a showing excellent performance and applied cobalt with positive charge in 0.2 milligrams and uh, showing, you know, uh, very good performance and very stable, okay. This is a, a you know, uh, we meet the department energy uh, for the durability, uh, you know, uh, requirement. requirement. Uh, this is a very stable, we even did a, uh, typically, DU is only required for 30K, but we did about 90K in 90K and still have very good performance and uh, very uh, little loss, very little loss, okay. Uh, how much time I have? So should I stop here or should I continue for a few slides? Yes, you can continue. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, like I said, so we're doing a lot of work on functionalization, right? This is the work that's a uh, you know, functionalized graphene uh, as a support uh, for prime, you know, for uh, fuel cell cast. And everybody knows the graphene is the single atomic six graphene layers. And so then, um, you know, it's just a separate from a graphite. And so then it's single layers, and this is our TM, high risk TM, and this is our own, you know, made gra homemade graphene sheet. Typically it's one layer or two layers. Okay? And this is what we call fingerprint. This is a Wrinkle, uh, graphene sheet wrinkles, and you can, you know, using TM to image this, make sure you find out where the graphene sheet is. Okay. Um, the unique about the graphene sheet is the electronic structure. Okay. So each of the carbon atoms you know, will be um, form a, you know, covalent bond from neighboring, you know, carbon atoms. So the p orbitals will with a force, you know, six of carbons and uh, so parallel to each other and form a nicely pi bond. So therefore, you know, each carbon on the graphene sheet uh, meet with, you know, satisfy the carbon, you know, bonding requirement is a very stable. And extremely, you know, high, this is a structure, the electronic structure, you, you, you know, lead to a extremely high, you know, uh, conductivity. Okay, conductivity. And uh, it's amazing, uh, even better than uh, the server. Okay. It's about one uh, times 10 eight, you know, the same as per meter per meter. Um, so um, the problem is to utilize the graphene sheet is the catalyst of support. So we have problem with number one is highly hydrophobic, okay? Number two is going to be restacking. So when you trying to remove the water out, you know, from graphene dispersion though, it's so easy to get it back to the, you know, graphite state, okay? So therefore, so it's loads, complete loads, the beautiful graphene's, you know, properties. In particular, for high, you know, conductivity and high chemical stability. So the key is, you know, how do you prevent, right? How do you prevent this restacking to take place during the catalyst synthesis and MEA preparation, okay? So what we're trying to do is here we're using kind of, you know, spacer technology, okay? Basically what we're trying to do is, uh, 
we're trying to do here is basically um, yeah so uh, another benefit because if you put the you know the um, functionalized groups right like an SO3 group or COG groups and it's going to transfer the proton right transfer proton and so provide a surface you know product trans you know, uh, transportation and the second one and the the, the function groups on you know graphing surface help to improve the kind of particles you know dispersion on this side is non functionalized you know graphing sheet you can see the panel nanoparticles centralized centered on the graphing edge okay and those are very few randomly dispersed of graphing sheet now this one is a pdi functionalized you can see the you know kind of nanoparticles uniformly dispersed of the graphing sheet okay so um uh, this is another one so we did uh, um what's called the um uh, identical location dm so basically uh we take dm image right so to observe you know those uh you know ratio position for each of those uh kind of particles then we take out of the dm grids and put the electrochemical cells and cycling between 0 0.6 1 1.0 volts for once on cycles to simulate the degradation so then after that, so we put it into ATM scope. And so then observe the relative, you know, position, uh, location change, okay? And so this is what we did, right? This is our SO3, functional graphene. And to begin with, you can see those three particles, they are your distance about 0 .6, 0 .6 and 5.6. So this is after the functionalization, after the cycling, after cycling. And uh, so you can see that. So this is the distance, um, you know, where we're uh, small. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I should take it back. No. So after cycling, you know, cycling though, and the distance between those particles and become four point, you know, four nanometers. And so, you know, this is from 6.6 .6 to four nanometers. And this is a, you know, SO3 functionalized graphene. And uh, between here is a four nanometers and here is 11. After cycling, and this is one still four nanometer and still 11 uh, nanometer, which means the SO3, you know, functional groups really help to uh, hold the nanoparticles over graphene sheet. Over graph. um, so, this is using XAS, and uh, so the shift of the bending energy really suggests how much, you know, how strong the uh, private nanoparticles on different. Uh, you know, carbon support. Right. Um, so the to prevent the restacking, so what we're using called the uh, spacer technology. So basically, we functionalize the you know graphene sheet, and also functionalize the carbon you know uh, nanoparticles. This is a be positive charge as be negative charge. So therefore, once mixing them together in the in the liquid, and so then they're going to self assembly from a three dimensional, you know, the composite structure. And so this is really going to improve the performance. Okay. And you can see that this is a comparison before and uh, the uh, using the spacer and so the, the almost no pro value. And so after you add the spacer and the red line. So then, the significant pore volume is showing up. You do build the channels between uh, graphene sheet, graphene sheet. And this is a you know P, uh, this is a you know fuel cell performance, and this is a hydrogen and air, and this is oxygen. So you basically tell us there is still some um, you know uh, diffusion uh, problem, though, diffusion problem. And so then we realized because you know, graphene sheet, if a sheet is too big, uh, we're typically using about like three to five uh, diameters, the graphene sheet. And the channel is very long, so therefore you form a diffusion barrier. So if you can cut to the nano graphene sheet, the 200, 300 nanometers, okay, this will significantly shorten the channels, improve 
the diffusion though. And you can see this is a per volume chain, okay? This is a, you know, normal graphing sheet, and this is a red is a, you know, non-graphing sheet is significantly increase the per, you know, metal per volume, okay? And uh, so this is really, uh, uh, this one is, uh, you know, the first one is only using SO3 edge, right? And uh, is the, um, uh, no, um, no functionalized graphene, and this one using PBF functionalized graphene with positive charge, and you know, intact with negative charge, so we can reduce the efficient uh, loss from 100, so 500 to about 250, and further increase to using nanom graphene heat, we can further you know reduce to about uh, you know 160 uh, uh, you know uh, efficient loss. Okay. So this is uh, how you can utilize graphene sheet and make the you know the graphene based catalyst and for fuel cells. And we are the only group in the world we can make a graphene based support catalyst you know working the fuel cells. If you're such a new teacher, right? There's a thousand papers talking about you know our graphene based catalyst, but only we have the you know fuel cell performance data in our publication. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip those. I think the time's running out. Uh, so I'm going to skip. And this is a um, uh, we're working with we have a natural lab and using our graphene sheet to develop a new cats from a platinum nickel nitride, which is much stable and uh, a much higher performance though. So here's a conclusion and control anomer interface can be realized utilizing the electrostatic attractions and constructing Russian design anomer catch interface leading to a significant uh, um, reduction on oxygen diffusion, achieving high mass activity at current density. So, and three dimensional finalized graphene is a good catalyst support and can be used for meeting all the DOE requirement, okay. Um, so here's the publications uh, for those work. And finally, and the future work. And uh, uh, I'm gonna stop here and thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, for Professor Chia, for this very interesting uh, talk in which you showed us some situations in which interfacers are key components for mass transport, as well as from catalytic processes. And, and while we also could see some re very nice results re re uh, related to some different characterization techniques. Well, we have time for questions and comments. We can also help translating them if needed. Carlos, por favor. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Really amazing uh, this interface work you're working on. I, I, I have several questions, but the main one is how do you identify that it was uh, oxygen transfer resistance, mass transfer resistance, rather than other mechanism related, I, I don't know, the church transport or, or, or some mechanism related to the electrical double layer? You know, how do you identify it was oxygen mass transfer resistance and not other transfer mechanisms in, in the operation of the of the system? Ah, okay. Um, let me uh, very quickly uh, go through those. Um, Yeah, this is uh, uh, what we, uh, oh my, yeah. So um, this is uh, what we did uh, using limited current density study. Basically, um, so this is a basically, uh, uh, in this, using this technique, so basically using um, uh, what we call the, uh, um, Hylix, okay. So basically this is a, a gas 
um, I think it's about like a, a five percent oxygen uh, mixed with uh, helium. Okay, so in this case, so what, whatever the current you measure is purely from oxygen. Okay, and this process is controlled by the oxygen diffusion through the ionomer field. Okay, so um, so this is a really uh, um, in, 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 this is a um, I can send you the uh, paper though, and this is a well-established methodology. Uh, General Motors and the United Technology Corporation uh, Research Center. Uh, so they developed this methodology. Basically, they just uh, uh, to, to determine your diffusion resistance, uh, you know, for uh, oxygen through the animal field. So, yeah. So you had to, uh, you know, under different RH. And so then you basically cancel out other effects so then the only thing left is oxygen diffusion uh, resistance through the field. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I explained clearly, but- No, 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 yes, 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 yes. Let, let's say I, uh, uh, it, it was one question. The another one was related, okay. Now when you use this technique, you can elucidate the uh, mass transport resistance play an important role, mainly those of Opsia. But uh, uh, how do you identify if these mass transport resistance are from the bulk of, of the system or are the interfacial, Region related to the double uh, to the electrical double layer. Uh, yeah, have you given a name? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, it's I wouldn't worry about too much about double layer though. And double layer is just like uh, you know when you charge or discharge, right? So that's going to be double layers. And uh, in this case, uh, what we really worry about is. Uh, we did some modeling though. I don't, I don't, I really don't want to get into this so much details because you see this is a, you basically, the technology, you know, technique we're using is a major limit current density, okay? Because you're using only, you know, this is a really a only like a five or 4% acid in the helium. So the helium, you know, the reasons why we don't using nitrogen, right? Because nitrogen diffusion has some, uh, um, uh, diffusion resistance for oxygen diffusion. The helium is almost zero now, okay? So you exclude that part. And so then, so we have, you know, limited current density measured by that part. And so then the important thing is when, we, when you have your data, right? So basically you start from a, we call from a diffusion layer, okay? So you oxygen diffuse through a diffusion layer first, then come into cast layer. So then, you know, diffuse through the pores in the catalyst layer come into all the surface ionomer and through the ionomers reach about, you know, platinum surface, okay? So you have three parts, you know, diffusion resistance from, a, you know, dub, you know uh, uh, diffusion layer, diffusion through the catalyst layer, and then diffusion through the ionomer layers. Because we are, so for three kind of, you know, this is a, the work we did here is using this uh, technique, right? Using this technique, and uh, so we we did it for three of those. You know, three basically the you know negative charge, positive charge, and a blank a control, right? So we have three layers, and three different you know MEAs. So we're thinking all have the same uh, diffusion layer, right? And so the pore size larger enough. Okay, that be canceled out. Only difference is the diffusion through, also diffusion through the ionomer field. And thicker will have a higher um, diffusion resistance. Okay, that's our base, you know, our baseline. I mean, that's the uh, base uh, where we have okay. analysis. Okay, so you can have the two different RH, so then you can figure out and uh, we'll call the effectiveness, you know, thickness of the, uh, in fact, you have sickness of the, you know, animal uh, sickness, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Not a problem, just send me an email, I can send you the papers and uh, if you need, uh, this is a voice type of, you know, uh, uh, methodology. 
Thank you very much. I will mail. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there some other questions or comments? You can either use the chat or just raise your hand. Well, you, you mentioned that uh, graphene is a uh, hydrophobic material and uh, presence of water is important uh, for PM fuel cell performance. So did you observe some important or, or significant differences when, when using this kind of materials compared to, to commercial ones, um, but particularly related to, to the presence of water in the polymers? Mm -hmm. So you mean commercial cats, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I may uh, just uh, rush us through those. I mean, the, the biggest challenge for the uh, fuel cell, you know, uh, current exchange membrane fuel cells is the stability of the carbon support, okay? In general speaking, so like a carbon based, right? Uh, you know, carbon black based, uh, they're pretty, uh, high, you know, amorphous carbon, okay? For long-term durability and typically where the DOE set a target for um, is uh, uh, for support, right? For support is, uh, uh, 5,000 cycle, okay? And the potential is from uh, uh, 1.0 volts to 1.6 volts, okay? Basically, you try to oxidize the, the carbon, try to oxidize the carbon. It's a simulator, it's about 5,000 hours, operating hours in a fuel cell, okay? Uh, the, the bigger problem, you know, uh, fuel cell industry have is um, the carbon black, okay? Carbon black. So, during the um, long time, during, you know, um, operation, carbon black be oxidized, okay, oxidized. And so become a hydrophilic. So then uh, the more hydrophilic and the easier cause the flood, the performance is gonna drop in down, okay. Second thing is when, you know, surface, carbon surface oxidized, the plant not a part of it, you know, plant not a part of the carbon surface which lowers the performance, lowers the performance. So um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to looking for the carbon-based support is more stable than the carbon black, okay? So we, we start from a carbon black and we did uh, functionalized carbon black, then we did a uh, nanographite, okay? Because graphite is more stable than the carbon black. So then after, you know, nano graphite, we're thinking which more is, which one is more stable than graphite. So then we thought about the graphene. Because as I show you guys, the graphene, you know, electronic structure is, is a um, um, saturated bonding structure, right? You know, pseudo, you know, you have pi bond. So each of those carbons were stable. Now for the carbon black is basically is sp SP2. Those carbons on surface is SP2. But for graphene, it's all, you know, those SP3, SP3, okay, the bonding structure. So therefore, so graphene is more stable. That's the whole reason why we're using graphene as support. But graphene is so hydrophobic, it's hard to disperse in the water. So make the catalyst synthesize it difficult. So we're trying to functionalize it and make the hydrophilic. So once you can disperse in the water, then you can synthesize the catalyst. You, know, you can put it a load of the plant nanoparticle or you know, plant uh, alloy nanoparticles on the graphene sheet. I'm not sure, do I answer your question or? <laughs> yes, you did. Um, you mentioned that, that the film thickness was crucial for for the performance uh, of, of these devices. Um, have you tried some other fabric fabrication techniques? 
Oh yeah, yeah. We try a lot of different family techniques. Uh, I can uh, probably say uh, our MEA technology is one of the best. So our MEA performance com you know comparable uh, with uh, Toyota and uh, General Motors MEA performance under same condition. Okay. So that, that, you know, you can think about that way. We are in academia, right? We're not a corporation, we're not a company though. But our MBA technology, even slightly better than theirs. Yeah. So we have to try all different ways. Now we're using spray dry. I mean, uh, the um, uh, spray coating method. So using commercial by the robotic you know, spray machine. But using, the key is the different ink recipe, how uh, different ratios, you know, solvent ratios, and the solvents with animal ratio, okay? and all the parameters you had to control those. Thank you. Do we have uh, some more questions or comments? Hello, Professor, this is Kayla. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, I would like to ask a little bit more gross questions regardless to the future and uh, how is that the investment in the fuel cell market? Uh, you just mentioned that Toyota and those companies are investing in the fuel cell, but uh, probably I can see a little bit more like uh, right now investing in batteries. So what can you tell us about the from your general perspective, uh, this is a this is a fantastic question. Though I, uh, <coughs> I'm teaching this semester. I'm teaching fuel cell class. Oh, this is a really good question. Okay, I'm doing research on both battery side and a fuel cell side. Okay, um, I tell you a story though. Uh, while I'm writing fuel cell proposal, right, and I'm saying, okay. Um, the, the battery, you know, uh, electric car, right? But just removing their emission from each individual vehicles to the power plant, right? So because when they're charging their vehicles, the electricity coming from power plant, right? So for now, our society is still built up based on the hydrocarbon, right? So it doesn't matter using coal, natural gas, right? Heavy oils, feed stocks, right? Even wood, right? Whatever you burn is all hydrocarbon based. So it's got all you're gonna produce the carbon emission, right? So the battery electric vehicles is only moving the em carbon emission from each individual vehicle, right? To the power plant. Is that we're still using the carbon, you know, hydrocarbon based fuel for our society? Yes. So I'm saying, okay, because hydrogen is a non carbon fuel, right? So therefore, hydrogen, you know, inherently will be no pollution, no carbon emission, right? So fuel cells, the only, you know, emission is a water vapor. So we're, we have to develop a fuel cell. Right. Yeah. Big. Now, when I'm writing battery, you know, proposals, I'm saying, oh, you know, because the fuel cell have high efficiency, uh, zero emissions. However, there's an issue for fuel cell vehicles because you fracture, right? So there's not too many hydrogen refueling stations. Right. I'm not sure how many in, in Mexico, uh, in the United States. I think there's less than 20 of those. Right, less than 20 of those. So even hydrogen fuel cells vehicles, more cleaner, right? And, uh, but your infrastructure is not enough, right? So therefore I'm saying, we need to develop the battery, you know, vehicles. Okay, now, um, this is a kind of like a um, joking though, but uh, I'm doing both side research, but I think ultimately the fuel cell is the, um, the ultimate solution for carbon emission, okay? Because, uh, 
because our society is still based on the hydrocarbon, you know, fuel. However, um, there's a lot of renewable energy source, right? Wind, wind, you know, wind power, solar, uh, hydropower, uh, tide, right? Geothermal, right? So those energy for now should not be fully used. So if you're looking for, you know, windmills, right? A lot of those stop because so it's not because there's no wind. It's because the power, you know, grids doesn't want to take that much. They cannot take it. So because of sometimes the wind blows stronger, sometimes the wind blow, you know, weaker. And so the fluctuation of the power output is so high. So, you know, for, for instance, right, you may get like a 50 megawatts like this time, and then five minutes later, so you may have like a two kilowatts, right? The power grids cannot take the fluctuation so much. If that's input, the cost class of power grids, okay? So for now, a lot of renewable energy will be wasted. Okay, as far as I know, I think the, the static is saying only 10% of renewable energy be taken to the grid. Most of those, wasted, right? Solar, when dark coming, right? When dark is, so there's no you know, solar energy coming. Now, if you think about that way, if you electrolyze water, so that's a matter, you know, what time, right? So when power is strong and wind power or, you know, solar power is strong, you electrolyze water, you know, store the hydrogen as energy carriers, right? So you put energy into a tank. So, when there's no wind or no you know, sunshine, right? So you can use the hydrogen produce electricity back to the grid to balance the, you know, the, uh, the energy you know, output. So I think the energy eventually will be a reliable source, I mean, for hydrogen and because hydrogen is no carbon emission at all. Yeah, that sounds pretty good for the future of us people who are making research on fuel cells. But uh, yeah, I was a little bit, uh, yeah, intrigued about that situation. So thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome. Any more questions or comments? Yes, we'll, we'll have one more here. For new young researchers interested in the hydrogen field, what would you recommend to focus on hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, or fuel cells? Yeah, this is a good question, though. Uh, I, I would, you know, recommend or encourage you uh, for hydrogen production, and particularly for uh, electrolyzer water to produce hydrogen. I think now it's a technology far from uh, mature, though. I believe for current efficiency is only in the range of 20 to 30%. This is a far low below to commercialize, okay? We really need to pump up this to say 90%, right? And the thing about that way, people talk about regenerative fuel cell, which means just like we take wind energy, right? Wind energy or solar energy in the daytime, right? So you want to be, the fuel cell system is a, a, a electrolyzer, right? But the efficiency is only 20%. Even your fuel cell, you know, when you re generate the, you know, electricity using the hydrogen you generate, right? But the two-way efficiency will be very low. So the bottom of, you know, neck for now is still hydrogen production. And particularly for um, electrolyzing, uh, you know, for, uh, for, uh, water, and this is a really the bottleneck. And the uh, Department of Energy now, uh, fuel cell technology, a hydrogen fuel cell technology office, shift a lot of effort. I think it's now about 60 or 70 percent effort on hydrogen production. Okay, fuel cell, I think is pretty good already. Okay, um, so uh, this is really, I, I suggest you encourage you to go for electric catalysis, for hydrogen, I mean, for water uh, splitting, and or some, sometimes people talk about, you know, photovoltaic, right? Photo, uh, you know, uh, uh, catalysis for, uh, you know, water splitting. And those are really good field and uh, to start. 
and also the good funding to uh, get in the future. So, yeah. Thank you, Professor Xie. Well, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Xie for, for this wonderful webinar, uh, for your time as well. And thank you all the attendees. Uh, we invite you to, uh, to be present in, in, in our future webinars. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good day. All right, thank you for the, for the wonderful opportunity. Thank <laughs> you.